Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Spatial Revolution, Architecture and Planning in the Early Soviet Union by Christina Crawford, published by Cornell University Press. The Detroit News reporter Philip Adler traveled through the Soviet hinterland in the summer of 1929 to assess progress on the first five-year plan, Joseph Stalin's hyper-industrialization drive. He gave his depression-striking U.S. readers a glimpse of the plan's material effects through the train window. The country's landscape is changing. Traveling in Russia by train or boat, you see yellow smoke stacks of new factories rising among the golden cupolas of churches and belching clouds of black smoke against the blue sky. You see everywhere new three, four and five-story apartment houses, workmen's dwellings, not blocks, but complete city sections, rising among the dilapidated ramshackles of yore. In the midst of thick forests or on river banks, you run into completely new cities of 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 inhabitants, with some new factories as a nucleus. Adler's reportage captured the Soviet Union amid a seismic shift from a rural landscape of thick forests and quiet river banks to a man-made industrial territory. Constructing these cities during the early years of the Soviet period was hard work that required a massive mobilization of materials and labor. Soviet administrators frantic to meet the plan's goals also had to contend with a rapidly evolving conceptual framework for socialist space-making. If capitalist cities were dense, hierarchical and exploitative, Soviet economic and spatial planners asked at the time how might socialist space be differently organized to maximize not only productivity, but also equality and collectivity. These theoretical discussions were important. The future of a new kind of urban form rested on the correct formulations. But the plan's timeline was set. As the spatial debates raged on, concrete foundations were being poured. It was simultaneously a time of possibilities and crisis. The first Soviet industrialization drive in the late 1920s to the mid-1930s was one of unprecedented speed and unfathomable scale. The first two five-year plans for economic development projected the construction of thousands of new industrial enterprises in remote and sparsely populated locations like the Urals, Siberia and the Soviet Far East. 87 new towns were to be built to accommodate a population of 4.5 to 5 million and hundreds of additional workers' settlements were planned near existing urban centers. Over 10 years, 6 to 7 million people were to be put to work and housed, all by the Soviet state. These were official capital construction targets. To get at what was built and how, this book focuses on the evolution of the socialist spatial project in geographically peripheral but economically central locations where capital expenditure was greatest and design experimentation most intense. Three sites, Baku, Magnitogorsk and Kharkiv, were selected by the Soviet government for rapid development in exceedingly difficult economic circumstances, because each played an important role in early Soviet industrial growth. Baku, Azerbaijan, was the Soviet oil bank. Magnitogorsk, Russia, the model Soviet steel town. Kharkiv, Ukraine, the source of a pre-existing skilled workforce able to staff a Soviet machine-building industry. Each was a site where spatial planning arose early, between 1924 and 1932, where targeted capital improvements bolstered economic development and where the precepts of socialist urbanism were tested on specific projects. 
These sites materialized despite conditions of economic austerity and technological inadequacy, and often due to harrowing human cost. Architecture and planning activities in the early Soviet period were kinetic and negotiated. Up until the late 1930s, socialist spatial practices and forms emerged not by ideological edict from above, but through an on-the-ground experimentation by practitioners in collaboration with local administrators, via praxis, by doing. Questions about the proper distribution of people and industry under socialism were posed and refined through the construction of brick and mortar, steel and concrete projects. Complications produced by imperfect sites, impossible deadlines and inchoate theories of socialist space-making forced practitioners to innovate. Ingenuity employed on one side was then harnessed by the burgeoning centralized planning apparatus to facilitate improvements on the next. The US journalist Anna Louise Strong noted this trend after touring a series of Soviet factory construction sites in the early 1930s. Those who point to improvements made under capitalism through competition, Strong wrote, overlook the improvements made in the Soviet Union by passing on expertise from one plant to another. Each building project was an opportunity to fine-tune standardized architectural and urban models for installation elsewhere in the seemingly boundless Soviet territories. Successful urban units that bundled workplace and housing, evenly distributed social services and robust municipal transportation were then planted on far-flung sites on other socialist states and were tried in capitalist welfare states as well for decades to follow. This book contributes to and expands on early 20th century architecture and planning scholarship in three specific ways. First, it brings needed attention to constructed works of the early Soviet period, most instructive for their very materiality. Second, it is a history of the built environment that foregrounds specific economic conditions, linking the economy and space to bring the spatial turn to Soviet economic history. And third, it provides a wide geographical scope that zooms in and out to ally and compare specific industrial nodes where transunion and transnational exchanges of design expertise occurred. In its first 15 years, the Soviet Union passed through three economic periods, war communism, the new economic policy and the first five-year plan. Economic planning and spatial planning were distinct fields of action in the early Soviet period. Economic, not spatial planners determined the percentage of the state budget allocated to capital construction. Understanding the economic limits of change to the built environment provides a crucial corrective to architectural histories that hold the work of Soviet architects and spatial planners captive to expectations of what they might have accomplished in a friction-free context. Creativity and innovation emerged on these sites in the face of fiscal and technological limits, and design strategies like architectural standardization that were developed out of necessity impacted later developments. The specific method deployed here, nodal history, engages in oscillation between multiple scales of inquiring, moving between single sites and the larger territories in which those sites are allied and materially connected. It is in depth to the concept of circulatory localities coined by Yves Cohen in his work to expose the prevalence of Stalinist borrowing in the 1930s and to actor network theory insofar as it is relational. Nodal history pays most attention, however, to the impact of circulating ideas and people on the design of physical sites, the nodes themselves. 
This is the first comparative parallel study of Soviet architecture and planning to create a narrative arc across a vast geography, and is thus distinguished from recent publications that examine a single city over an extended time frame, using that city as a lens through which to extrapolate broader economic, political and social themes. Nevertheless, the work of juggling multiple sides and pulling back to see the big picture has been undertaken without a paradigmatic roadmap. An accurate mapping of this narrative quickly transgresses the political borders of the Soviet Union, with pins dotting English garden cities, housing settlements in Weimar Germany and oil extraction sites in the United States, among other locations. Sites like Baku, Magnitogorsk and Kharkiv were nodes in a global network developed at the beginning of the 20th century that freely shared experts, technologies and materials. Ideas, both spatial and social, circulated even more rapidly, definitively upsetting Cold War assumptions about Soviet isolationism. Who is responsible for providing housing and social services to the working class? What are the constituent elements of the good city? What is the role of standardization and mass production in architectural design? How should the modern housing unit be spatially configured? All of these questions were posed in an international context, and the development of Soviet sites contributed heavily to the evolution of these debates. Conceptually, nodal history welcomes collaboration. It proposes that there is just one densely populated map, drawn without political borders, on which scholars collate corresponding research. The economic and spatial relations between research nodes render political borders subservient to connectivities. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.